Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is a very special episode in which we've got a guest interviewer. Returning to the show is Dr. Tom Fletcher. Hi, Tom. Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, but how about you? How did you end up doing a PaleoCast interview? I looked out on this occasion. We were going to go to the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology uh, conference in Calgary and I saw uh, on the field trip list the Burgess Shale. I'd always wanted to go to the Burgess Shale ever since a kid. I was a bit of a nerd as a kid, as most paleontologists are at some point. And I thought to myself, this is an opportunity I cannot miss. So we went out there. Um, I saw on the email list beforehand, though, that uh, John Long was going to be coming along as well, Professor John Long. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, his work. He's a fish worker as well. And I thought, yeah, we'll try and do an interview up on top of the Burgess Shale. So not only did we go to the Burgess Shale and do a paleocast interview on the Burgess Shale, it was also the day of the solar eclipse as well. So uh, we got to experience the solar eclipse at the Burgess Shale and I did an interview with one of my paleontological heroes. So it was a good day, a very good day. But what is this episode actually on? Is it on the Burgess Shale? Partly, yes. We couldn't pass up the opportunity. Uh, John is a, a fish worker, as I say, and the Burgess Shale is famous for having exceptionally preserved fossils, some of which may be the earliest vertebrates. So we couldn't pass the opportunity to talk a little bit about that. But mostly we talked about the go-go formation, this uh, wonderful preservation of uh, things like fossil fish skulls, uh, which possibly John's best known for. And how was recording in the field? The Burgess Shale isn't, you know, at the back of someone's house. It's in a huge mountain range on top of a mountain. Was it a pretty difficult setting to record in? Yeah, it was It was an early decision for me not to take the whole shebang kit because to take everything up there would have been very heavy and it was quite a long hike up. So couldn't take the traditional equipment to do an interview, but instead uh, we had two phones and we used the phones to record the audio. Uh, one in his top pocket, one in my hand, and it went quite well. The The wind was a bit of an issue, but we were, we were huddled over and protecting the microphones. But thankfully uh, it turned out all right, I think. And also we got a nice background track of uh, rocks breaking in the background. Those rocks you can hear breaking in the background are, uh, are people turning over pebbles and bits of rock to, to try and find Burgess Shale fossils. A huge group of vertebrate paleontologists who were going to the conference uh, all scrounging around looking for morella and trilobites. And we couldn't really move for trilobites, they were absolutely everywhere. It was quite a, a strange but wonderful place to do an interview. I would expect it's a kind of disappointing place to go for a vertebrate paleontologist. You're just there flipping over all of these beautiful trilobites, but you've got no real academic interest in them. Nonsense. No, the Burgess Shale is one of those places. It's almost a mecca for geologists of any uh, any sub-discipline. You really can't help but get excited in the place. It, it, the best word I can describe is is enchanting, but also you get a sense of deja vu as well. You, you've seen the, the Burgess Shale in so many textbooks and so many um, children's books even, if you're interested in fossils. So by the time you get there, it, it's, it's almost like you've been there before. It's a very odd feeling. When I was walking down the mountain at the end of the day, I realised that my face was hurting and I couldn't quite work out why for a second or two. And then I realised the whole day I'd been smiling just non-stop. It really is that kind of uh, special place for any paleontologist or even any geologist, I'd say. It's a, it's a cool place. You make every effort to go there in your lifetime if you can. Certainly a bucket list place for me. Are you sure it wasn't just because you'd recorded your first paleocast interview? That might be the case too. I mean, we've, we've got lots of factors here. The solar eclipse <laughs> in Canada, going to the Burgess Shale, there's a vertebrate paleontology conference coming up and... Of course, I'm representing Paleocast at the same time. So, yeah, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure it's an accumulative thing. So before we get into the interview, we've got a bit of admin to get through. So in the last episode, we ran a competition and we chose a winner at random and that was Lewis Jones. And so those prizes will be on their way to you. And as always, we've got pictures of what we're discussing on our website. So please head on over there to see those. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with all those you think might be interested. Welcome to all you new listeners that have joined us recently. And we hope you all enjoy this interview with Professor John Long.
Today I'm joined by John Long, past president of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, president of the Royal Society of South Australia and professor of biological sciences at Flinders University, Australia. John, welcome to Paleocast. Oh, it's good to be here, Tom. I think the first thing we should get out of the way is where this interview is happening. It's quite special today. Uh, we're at the world-famous site of exceptional fossil preservation, the Burgess Shale. Uh, could you describe the significance of where we are today? Yeah, well, the Burgess Shale is actually a World Heritage Site designated by UNESCO because it's one of the, the first sites in the world where the Cambrian explosion, that the great abundance of species occurring at the beginning of the Phanerozoic period from you know, the Phanerozoic started 542 million years ago, and this site right here where we're sitting is about 505 million years ago. So up until that period, um, most Cambrian fossils were only known from hard-shelled parts that fossilised well, like bits of trilobite or arthropod. But this site, discovered by Walcott in um, 1909, was the first Cambrian site to show soft-bodied fauna. And it meant there was a much greater diversity of species here than people ever dreamed of from the Cambrian. So by studying all these different types of worms and early arthropods and mollusks and things that come from this site, the term Cambrian explosion came into the, the common lingo where we see that the fossil record is relatively sparse for the first nine-tenths of Earth history, but bang, in the Cambrian, all the modern groups appear nearly all at once and that's the the Cambrian explosion. Fantastic. What's, this is, we ask this to a lot of people as well from all walks of life, uh, academia, uh, people going through their PhD. Uh, what first sparked your interest in paleontology? Well as a kid age seven I started collecting fossils. A, a mate of mine at school, I had a father who collected fossils as a hobby, took us out to a quarry, a Devonian site in Melbourne and I hit a rock and just like these trilobites on the ground around me found a trilobite and I just got hooked to think that there was I standing in a paddock in outside of Melbourne and what was 400 million years ago the bottom of the ocean with these creatures swimming around and uh, that day we found many fossils and then I eventually discovered there were lots of fossil sites in the urban Melbourne area that a kid could get to by, by bus and so we started collecting fossils and uh, it just grew from there. It's remarkable how many uh, people's story is similar to that, the, the feeling of seeing something that nobody's ever seen. Not, not that nobody's seen in millions of years, but no human, nothing even like a human has, has seen before that point. Yeah, well, at first it's just the joy of finding a nice fossil and getting that thrill, like, wow, I found a really nice trilobite. But do you know that first trilobite I found, and it was 1964, I was seven years of age. I've still got that trilobite, and I found out about ten years ago that it was a species described as new in 1968. And so I'd found a species that was undescribed as my first fossil, but I didn't even know it till much later. That's fantastic. And a sign of things to come, maybe. Yeah. Well, now the thrill comes from finding a new species of fossil or something spectacular that tells you something about evolution that we didn't know before. So one of the major focuses of your work is, is fossil fishes, especially of the Gogo Formation in Australia. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I first went up there in 1986. Um, I'd seen these fishes in the collections in the Australian museums and they represented fish that were 380 million years old that were three-dimensionally perfect. So most fossil fishes, people imagine them as like kippers squashed between two bits of shale. And that's indeed how most of the old red sandstone fishes described from the Devonian of Scotland are known. But Gogo is a special site because you can put the rocks in weak acetic acid, dissolve the limestone away, and you're left with a perfect skeleton, a three-dimensional skeleton like it died yesterday. You can open and close the mouth. You can look at the way the neck moves. Um, and in some cases, we're finding soft tissue in those fishes. So now we don't put them in acid anymore. We scan them with the synchrotron first, uh, the really well-preserved ones. And from that, we've got complete muscle, and we're even finding other organs that we haven't yet published, but that's coming up next. Wow, that's incredibly exciting. Yeah. Um, just to go back, the, I mean, what, what, where, where is it? Uh, where, oh, sorry, Gogo is up in the, the Kimberley, the far northwest of Western Australia. And uh, it, it's part of an ancient giant reef system that spanned about a 400-kilometre area. And between those reefs, you get these inter-reef basins where the mudstone accumulated. And these fish, a great variety of them, lived on and around the reef, eventually died, floated and sunk into this basin where they were 
because the chemical conditions were just right, they were like crystallised in limestone nodules rapidly before compaction of sediment above could squash them flat like your normal Devonian fish. And the other thing I've got to say about Gogo, it's not just the, the beautiful preservation of the fish that's taught us so much about the anatomy of these early vertebrates and, and the first fishes, the first jawed fishes, but it's also the great diversity there. It tells us a lot about the paleoecology of these ancient reefs, that fishes weren't just predators. There was a huge number of highly specialised fish that fed on corals or oncolites or, or, or other specialised invertebrates. And the geological setting, you mentioned it's a, it's a reef, so, I mean, how, how many species roughly have been... Up to, up to now, well, when the first British Museum expeditions were there in the 1960s and the first wave of taxonomic descriptions, they had about 25 species described. Since I've started going there in 86 and going back there every two or three years and, and collecting, we've doubled that. We're up to nearly 55 species in Gogo now. Um, uh, yes, I've been lucky enough to see those uh, Gogo fossils at the Natural History Museum in, in London, uh, collected by Harry Toombs in the 60s. Um, and they really are quite beautiful. Aesthetically, they're very beautiful. But of course, um, as one of your discoveries uh, shows, uh, Matapiscus, that revealed a lot more than just being pretty. Yeah, Matapiscus was a wonderful fossil. We found it on the 2005 expedition. And like many go-go fish, you find something in the field and you think you've got an idea of what it is, like it's a placoderm, but you don't know really what it is until you get it to the lab and you start preparing it out. And that one had a collection of bones inside it that at first we thought it was its last meal. But on closer examination, and we realised it had an umbilical cord and it was actually an embryo. And it was the world's oldest vertebrate embryo by at least 160 million years. So it pushed back the origin of live birth in vertebrates. Uh, but more importantly, it indicated they were having sex, uh, complex sex, they were copulating. So this is the, really the first hard evidence of internal fertilisation in early vertebrates. That certainly made headlines. Um, we've got uh, Have I Got News For You over in the UK, and uh, that, was, that was certainly something that was picked up on <laughs> by, yeah, by yeah. lots of news outlets, but it's a good, good way to... Yeah, well, Marta Pisces started a whole new paradigm shift in looking at these go-go fish because we never really thought there were embryos. Um, for example, a fish described in 1981 by the team from the British Museum in Sizescutum had little bones inside it and they described it as its stomach contents, its last meal. So after finding the first embryo we went back and we looked at all these again and we discovered there were more embryos and not just from one group of placoderms but from other groups of placoderms. So we had a whole series of four nature papers on placoderm sex basically. But the fourth one wasn't go-go, that was uh, the Scottish discoveries from the Orkneys where we looked at a, a placoderm called Microbrachius, an anti a strange little fish with bony arms on the side and we found some of them had like little pairs of legs and these turned out to be the males with large L-shaped claspers with grooves for, for transferring sperm. But the most amazing thing about it is how they had sex. With, with the ptictodonts and the, and the go-go placoderms we could see they, they must have copulated in a you know, in a missionary position kind of thing, like sharks do today. Sure. But these little microbrachius antiarchs, they had to lay side by side for the, the clasper to reach the midline of the female cloaca area. And it meant the funny, funny little arms these antiarchs had, for years we've wondered what they did. And we now know they had, would have had to hook inside each other to get purchase and to actually manipulate that clasper into position. So we think we, told, we solved two mysteries with that, that last nature paper that came out in 2015, and that also made a, a, a big wave of publicity, as you probably know. Mm. It's a, certainly it's a bump and grind like we never knew existed yeah. before. Well, well, that discovery <laughs> made it onto Stephen Fry's QI, it made it onto Saturday Night Live, the biggest American comedy show, <laughs> and it also made it onto Not the Nine O'Clock News on the BBC. Fantastic. Yes, those things, I mean, sex is going to sell, isn't it? I suppose. Oh, yeah. I suppose that leads us nicely to, uh, so you, is it 26 so far or more to come, I guess? The books that you've, you've uh, yeah, published so far? Yeah, um, some of them are, are like books that have been re republished with a new edition, with a new title, but... Yeah, there's about 26 odd titles I've, I've written. Yeah. I have to admit, my, uh, the rise of fishes got me through the first two months of my PhD because it was a very rich source of uh, information for me. But my favourite is yeah. Dawn of the Deed. Oh, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, Dawn of the Deed was fun to write. And, <laughs> but already it shows the nature of science. And already it's out of date because the new discoveries we made in Microbrachius weren't in that book. That book came out in 2011. And uh, the way science moves on with new discoveries in our field, it's already out of date. <laughs> but it's still a good read. I advise you readers to go out and read it if they haven't read it yet. <laughs> could you give a brief overview of what it's about and what it covers? Yeah, sure. Dawn of the Deed is the US title for what the Australian book 
by HarperCollins is called Hung Like an Argentine Duck, because the Argentine duck has the largest penis of any vertebrate. It's like 42 centimetres in a normal-sized duck, and it's corkscrew-shaped. So the book looks at the origin of sex through the fossil record, the Devonian discoveries and also other evidence through the fossil record, but it also looks at modern animals, and, and it puts it into an evolutionary context. So I do look at the weird ways that ducks mate and other mammals and so on. The um, Matapaisis, apologies that I've mispronounced it before, yeah. um, that was, uh, the, the species name was quite special to you, uh, quite, a, quite a long relationship with uh, David Attenborough. Yeah, so years. David, um, well basically in 1979 he did a series called Life on Earth, which is really one of his first really breakthrough series that, that was on all over the world. And in that show, when he demonstrated fish evolution, he, he chose one spot in the world, and that was Gogo. And so he went there and he, he, he showed some of these amazing three-dimensional go-go fish for the first time. And because of that, um, I named the fish after him, David uh, Matapaisis Attenborough. And when I caught up with Sir David when he was in Adelaide recently, he was just absolutely thrilled. And he actually has a spiel that's on YouTube where he talks about Marta Pisces and the discovery and he has a bit of a joke that now his name is always going to be associated with the origin of sex <laughs> but he doesn't mind he's such a nice chap it's, uh, it's nice you should check that out on YouTube because I think uh, he got straight off the helicopter didn't he and yeah. uh, he was told that there wouldn't be any fossils around picked up the first boulder he saw and it happened to be a skull of a fish didn't yeah, it yeah, yeah. And, and he's apparently... also got a um, I, I had a similar story when I was filming at GoGo with the ABC television and they said I hope you brought some fossils up with you and I said no 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 we'll find some out there and so they set the cameras up and that camera's rolling and I walk out with my hammer and I put my foot on a nodule and smash it and I go oh I found one <laughs> so I said oops sorry you're gonna have to film that again <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> so I went and rediscovered it again with 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 this uh there's some less vocal terms shall we say <laughs> yes that will have been beeped out but don't worry it wasn't anything too bad so among the, the go-go fishes, we also find specimens that are hugely important in our uh, picture of the story of vertebrate life, the evolution of vertebrate life. Uh, Goganesis, for example, shows the fish amphibian transition. Yes, it's a, a stem tetrapod, which means it's a fish that's approaching the grade of a tetrapod. Uh, these fish that, like Osteolepis is commonly known, Eusthenopteran, um, they're, they have like the pectoral fin, the front fins has a humerus ulnar radius, they have a, a fibula, tibia and fibula in the pe pelvic fin, but most of them are squashed flat. So Gogonasus was really the first one found at Gogo, and I'm really particularly pleased with Gogonasus because I described it, it was only known from a snout, so I called it the snout from Gogo. But then my first expedition up there, um, when I found a complete one, we found the first complete head. We found about five of them since then. And some of them have been CT scanned and revealed a huge amount of new detail, like the fact they had large spiracles on top of the head for breathing air, and uh, also a very advanced forelimb with, with uh, features that are more tetrapod-like in, in the pectoral fin that we weren't expecting. So we got a, a paper in Nature on that one in 2006. And um, recently we've put a whole complete gogonasis that's still in the rock unprepared through a neutron beam facility in Sydney, so we can image the whole fossil in the rock so it's going to be stunning what we get out of that. When Kate Trinistic found that one in 2011. So um, that's going to be another thing to look forward to where we reveal the whole body and soft tissue of gogonasis. So it's certainly embracing novel technologies. One has to in paleontology. We have to demonstrate to the physicists and chemists of this world that we're up there with the technology as well. Absolutely. I, th I think uh, a lot of people consider paleontology to be one of those Victorian stamp collecting type exercises, but it's so much more than that. Well, it used to be in the old days, you'd find a fossil, you'd sit down, you'd draw it, you'd write a paper, you'd describe it, and the whole game was describing new species. But now finding a new species means nothing unless it solves a, a problem or adds to the big picture of evolution that, that a particular problem you're working on. Like, you know, I, I look at these Devonian fish to solve the problem of the assembly of the human body plan and that's the big question we're always looking at when did limbs first evolve when did jaws teeth first evolve and what sequence did they appear and the gogo -go fish are just amazing to, to fill in some of those those big questions is there anything at the the gogo -go that you have been maybe expecting to find that you're looking forward to or something well, that you what was the most surprising thing vice versa well Every time we go back, we find something unexpected. It's like this place behind us, the Burgess Shale, where new and exciting things are still being found because people go there regularly and keep looking. And, uh, you know, I still remember in 1986, I was up there smashing rocks for about six weeks. And I didn't find much at all in the first week, and I thought it had all been collected by the British Museum. But eventually I found more stuff, and there was a, a bunch of new species in that first collection. 
Now we're finding things like coelacanths. We've got a complete three-dimensional perfect coelacanth, not just one but two, two specimens. And that's going to tell us a lot about the early nature of coelacanths and the, the rates of evolution. We've also got more sharks. So we found the first go-go shark. I found it actually July the 7th, 11 a.m., hit a rock, bang, a shark. After 60 years, we found the first shark. We've now got two. So we've described one, Gogo salacus, and it showed something really incredible, that it wasn't just cartilage, it was a mineralised cartilage in the skeleton that had remnant bone cells between the tesserae. So it shows that sharks had a bony origin and then were secondarily losing the bone to go to cartilage like they are today. So just finding even an incomplete specimen that's so well preserved can give you such an amazing depth of scientific information. Certainly more to come as far as the go-go goes. Well, we're going to keep going back, um, and we've still got a lot more nodules to prepare and, um, and to analyse, so you'll see a lot more coming out in the next couple of years from go-go, that's for sure. And finally, um, what do you think is the most exciting area in modern paleontology globally? That's a very good question. I would say um, the area of um, looking at paleoecology, the interrelationships of the organisms within the entire environment. I mean, you look at some of the best sites in the world, like the Jihol Biota of, of China, and we can identify a whole range of dinosaurs and birds and fishes and things, turtles and things. But it's looking at the paleoecology and what that tells us about the, um, the food chains and um, how certain species were able to survive and what niches they occupied. I mean, you know, the Jihol boat has just produced only last week uh, two papers in Nature on gliding mammals by Shishi Lo and his team. Um, just incredible that dinosaurs were always thought to have kept mammals in their shadow for 160 million years. And just now, in 2017, we're learning we had gliding mammals like very advanced kind of gliding possums today already in the Jurassic you know, before the G-hole biota, I should, should say. So it, it, it's the great diversity and also the rates of evolution that we're learning about, which is a, which is a new big interesting area. I get the impression we're, we are living in a really exciting time as far as paleontology goes. We're, we're living in a boom period, especially with novel technology coming in and all these new discoveries that are filling the gaps. It, yeah, it seems like an exciting field. It is indeed. Um, it's not just the novel technologies that are being developed. It's the fact that people are aggressively going out and working sites. You know, in the old days, people would wait for something to turn up and bring, some, bring it into a museum or they'd go out once in a blue moon to collect but now teams get the funding and they go out every year. And if you keep hammering these same sites, then amazingly new things turn up. And uh, I, I suppose the, the question, the last, the very last question would be, what's the outlook for Australian paleontology at the moment? Is the funding there for people to go and do that kind of work? Well, we're not well funded. We're on, probably on par with, with Britain and the US that, you know, a certain percentage of people get big ARC grants. Um, I've got two at the moment and one of them's on the origin of tetrapods. So we've just got permits to open up um, quarries in national parks in Australia next year. So that'll be another burst of field work and the Mount Howitt site, which is Devonian fish completely fish. Um, I think this is a very healthy site, a uh, very healthy way in general Australian paleontology because we've got some excellent world-class sites and got some good teams working on them and um, there's also a lot of unexplored country out there. Professor John Long, thank you very much. My pleasure Tom. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin-Silverstone and Caitlin Colary, who was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.